All right. Um, thank you very much, everyone. So this is going to be the panel on culture change and productivity. Um, two of the people on this panel you have seen before. Uh, the other people going from furthest away from me are James Baker, uh, Martin Donnelly, and Caroline Jay. Um, as you can see, all of the people on the panel are just people that are part of the broader collaborations workshop participants. So one of the things I will say about this park panel is this is not just about you asking questions of them and them answering. This is also going to be them asking questions of you and you answering. So uh, the, these lovely people have agreed to sit here in the limelight, mostly just to act as facilitators on this discussion. Um, what this means is that I will probably need to run around with a microphone quite a lot because we've only got one microphone, or maybe two. So we may use that microphone for people here and then this one for people in the audience. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you've already seen Kirsty and John speaking about their particular experiences. Um, the way that this panel is going to work is, first of all, uh, we're going to hear from the other three uh, panelists a little bit about their experiences with culture change and productivity and what they've been doing. Um, then I'll start off with a few questions and then very quickly go into questions <coughs> from the audience. Uh, and then as we go on, um, hopefully we will find a whole set of tips and tricks for um, being better at these two subjects, because I think they're topics which are dear to our heart. So um, I'll start over on this side um, and Let's just check whether this works. If not, I'll give you this microphone. Hello. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, what have I done to um, improve productivity and enhance culture change? So I think this is really hard because I have to start thinking, what evidence do I have that I've actually done anything in this frame at all? Right? So you, you go out and you talk to people and so on, and, but, but actually gathering the evidence is difficult. So I thought, okay, case study, that's always a good one to go with. Um, so in my lab, when I work with PhD students and so on, obviously we like to encourage them to share and, and they have to put their code online and they make it citable and all this kind of stuff. Um, but this is sometimes a challenge in kind of getting them to understand to begin with, um, particularly a lot of mine come from kind of psychological background and humanities background, maybe not used to this. Why, why do they need this massive overhead that is, you know, using version control and so on? And, um, and I kind of came up with a really good demonstration of it uh, by two of them having um, worked together. So increased productivity by getting more working together is fantastic. So they're skipping through days and these <coughs> doing all this fantastic work together. And they come to my office and they say, Caroline, um, can you, we, we've been talking about this, can you tell me which one of us is going to be able to put this work in our PhD thesis? Okay. okay, right, so how do we sort this out? Well, what we can sort it, we can sort it out quite easily because both of you are working on this project in GitHub. You're both committing your versions of the, you know, your updates and so on. So you can cite those. So actually they found it was quite easy to extricate what each of them had done, provide citable versions of the code, and uh, use that in their thesis, so problem solved. So I felt that was a success because they actually understood uh, why what we were doing was um, really helpful. That's really amazing. I, I would never have thought of being able to use GitHub commits like that. <laughs> it's like sharing the library. Okay, Martin. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'll talk about two things that we've done, uh, one on a um, UK uh, scale and the other on a European scale. The, 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 the DCC, um, I, I, I'll say a couple of things actually. Um, I feel like a bit of a fraud here because I'm not really a software person. And I thought, well, when I went to look at the, um, at the the table with all the stickers on it, I thought, oh, I'll decorate my thing. And then I thought, actually, that's pretty accurate, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did do some in, in the past. But what, what I'm really interested in and what I touched on in my um, uh, lightning talk earlier uh, was about the, the commonalities uh, between uh, approaches to research data and approaches to research software. Um, so the DCC, which is the, uh, the centre that I'm a, a part of at the University of Edinburgh, um, was uh, funded by HEFKE and then subsequently by JISC um, about four years ago or so, maybe five years ago, uh, to uh, carry out a series of institutional engagements uh, with uh, UK universities. And, and we did um, a, a couple of dozen of these. Uh, and that was working in partnership with um, all different stakeholders within each of these universities, from the researchers 
to the librarians, IT people, senior managers, policy type people, uh, compliance people who work on FOI or the data protection um, aspect to their jobs, uh, to uh, understand the research data, uh, the benefits of taking a more active approach to research data management, um, and the, the, the necessity, in fact, the, the kind of policy mandate type uh, approaches to that. Um, and that was, that, that was pretty successful. It, it, it came about around at the same time as the EPSRC, the Engineering and Film. I don't need to tell you what EPSRC stands for. Um, the, the EPSRC had uh, revealed its new um, data policy, which, meant they, which basically said that rather than it being delegated to the, um, the PIs, the, the way in which data was managed, had to be t uh, handled at an institutional level because ultimately it's the institution that receives the funding uh, and the institution is the long-lived entity. Uh, a research group is not as long-lived as that. A research project is by definition not a long-lived entity. Um, so that, 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 that's where that came from. Um, I, I, the second thing I'm going to talk about is the FOSTER project, uh, which is um, about facilitating open science um, uptake, among, especially among younger researchers. Uh, although we do talk to a wide range of, uh, of, of different people. And that is in response to or in support of the European Commission's um, uh, open data pilot, uh, which is an open data uh, policy. And that involved lots and lots of uh, webinars and advocacy and events and um, subterfuge and sabotage <laughs> and God knows what else, uh, all, all over Europe. And it was really interesting because it, it, it really brought home how different the norms are in different European countries and indeed worldwide. I was in Malaysia last, last week and, uh, and, and their norms are quite different to ours uh, in terms of how things work. Um, I, 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 it, the, there are commonalities and there are differences. In some countries you say, oh, um, obviously uh, this would be problematic because the researchers wouldn't do it and they scratch their head and say, if they don't do what they're told, they get fired. Um, and then they say, that is really not the way things work here. And it's not the way things work in Malaysia either. Um, so uh, that, that, that helps to um, uh, bring home the, um, the necessity of cultural sensitivity and, and, and tailoring your approach for um, the audience and the environment in which you're operating. I think that's probably far too much already. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Um, James, finally. OK, so I could talk about something more software specific, which is a a journal I, I edit called Programming Historian, which is entirely based on um, the Git and Git pages infrastructure, um, where we use Open Peer Review, which is really interesting in terms of the cultural change that that engenders among uh, historians who are looking to write lessons about how we might code. Um, but I want to talk about something that sounds much more trivial, but I think is more important um, and goes back to the themes of the keynote, um, which is um, I leave my door open and I walk into other people's offices, and when I leave their room, I some of you are going to hate me for this. I slightly leave their door open. Um, and I think in terms of generating cultures where people are productively collaborating without just firing emails between rooms in the same building, um, that little things and like leaving doors open um, I think can be incredibly productive. And when I moved to Sussex, I was struck by how many people were there, but you have no idea they were there. Um, and so that's something that I sort of upon myself. One of my colleagues does it as well, so of course. A couple of others. Um, I think little things like that are important parts of what we're talking about here. Um, sometimes it is easier to walk down the corridor than just you know have a conversation on the other person. I think uh, that's that's very sage advice. It's like those little life hacks. Although I don't know that it would work for me because I think that my colleagues actually do that anyway, but I'm never in my office, so <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, Anyway, thank you very much for introducing yourself a little bit about your own motivations. Um, so I'm going to kick off with, with kind of like a, a question that goes at the heart of one of the things that I was trying to understand about this topic, which is why have we put these these four words together: culture change and productivity. So you know, um, what do you think as a, uh, as panelists? Do you think one naturally leads to the other? Are they linked? Or have we actually just taken two very, very worthy topics and then smashed them together because we thought they were interesting and there's no link between them? Can, can you define it at this stage what you mean by productivity? Oh, that's a good question. Um, what do you think you mean by productivity? Uh, well, well, I think it depends. I mean, there's two different ways of looking at it. Well, there's, there, 
there's at least two different ways of looking at it. One is that you're doing more stuff, uh, and the, the other is that you're doing better stuff, or you could be doing both of those things. Um, so it, it, is it measured by volume, or is it, or, or, or is it by being able to do things that simply aren't possible by other means? Let's, let's say better or impossible. <laughs> so are the two linked? Is it, is it that we need culture change to achieve the impossible, or is it that by doing the impossible we achieve culture change? There's, there's maybe one way of phrasing it, there's no, no use whatsoever. <laughs> I, I, I feel very kindly sent into these questions, but I don't think about it. And I think there are three answers this is the hedgiest of all oh, yes. I love your answers. There is some ways in which it is positively correlated. There is some <laughs> in which it is negatively correlated. And some in which it's totally separate thing. So positively correlated, I think you've already sort of hit on that if you are that if you build a more positive culture and a more supportive culture, you will be more productive. And more importantly, if you have a sort of inclusive culture, you will create research that could not have been done alone or by a small group of white goods sitting in a room together. Um, I do think though that it requires a redefinition, that positive correlation requires a redefinition of um, productivity. Because what you can't do, and one of the reasons that it's very frustrating to try and do reproducible research and affect positive culture change and put your money where your mouth is, is that you can't publish crap science anymore. So you can't publish your like p-hacked sort of stories, or if you pre-register, for example, you now have to be honest about what you did and what was exploratory, you can't just sort of post, post hoc kind of come up with your story. So I think it does, I think if you were looking at some of the measures of productivity that we have today, which would be around like the volume, the number of outputs, and the sort of the sexiness of the outputs that we have, I think that, that you can end up being negatively correlated. Now, I, I still think that a better definition of productivity is the way forward to that, not to not do culture change. And then I also feel like the, the way in which they're different is that, some of the things that we're trying to achieve with culture change is more around building a fairer world. And that doesn't necessarily relate to pushing back the boundaries of science. Like you could be kinder to other human beings because you want to live in a world where people are kind to each other, not necessarily because you've like cured cancer faster. Both of those things are important, but they're, they're separable. I'm going to throw this open to the audience. What what do you think is a good definition of productivity? So so what do you think actually works for you and works for the world you want to live in? Uh, if we're to define this, who's who wants to have a have a stab at this? No one. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it just it goes down to very simple things, which is if you feel like going and complaining that something doesn't exist or that you know a place doesn't exist for a certain type of collaboration or a very simple tool doesn't exist, to not complain about it or, or chat with people about wouldn't it be great if it existed just to sit down and create it and show people that, yeah, I had a problem and then I fixed it. And it kind of, that's exactly what you were saying, it creates a world where problems get fixed and are visibly getting fixed. And even if they're very small problems, it sort of makes the environment a little bit nicer. And that's productivity for me. Thank you. Nice definition. A anyone else want to chip in with a uh, definition? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, personally, I feel like I'm most productive when, when I get things done and I feel that they were important things. And I think a productive environment is, is one where you're free to to do that, uh, and not what's sort of like dominated by everything else. Um, I, in, in my own work, you know, where I work, I think crises per unit time uh, is, is a really great one. Uh, so culture is, I think, just it's, um, it can be kind of problematic. There was a problem we had recently where it was, let's just say about $100 million was riding on this. And there was a big bug, there was a bug in the code. Person B had the bug. Person A knew about the problem, person A didn't talk to person B. An exploratory committee was formed to try to understand the bug better, but still they didn't make the connection between some person knew 
that they didn't, why they didn't communicate that to someone else. And part of that is just like culture, right? Some of it is siloing, some of it is like, how are these people working together and how are they actually interacting? Had it gone down a different way, we wouldn't have had that problem, wouldn't have had to waste thousands of dollars forming a committee. Uh, so I think it always gets back, so you don't even notice these things until something really big comes up. And then you realize, wow, we have some like deep-rooted issues, don't we? I think it's so interesting that so many of the answers are coming out around um, basically productivity is defined by you as the person and it's it's something that's personal to the way that you want to achieve something rather than it being defined as part of a much wider this is what the world needs to do. So I, I'm really intrigued by that. James? I, I was just proud that the, the, I agree with you but I guess, I guess there's another way that productivity may be felt by people which is there's a sense over here about the idea of productivity as me having the freedom to do what I want. Well, cultural change sometimes can and should be imposed. And so there is a kind of sense sometimes where we talk about productivity and it can feel to some people as though if they're not buying into it already, then someone's <coughs> going to impose it. And there can be a kind of negative sort of backlash reaction against productivity. So, and, I, and I'm not defending that nor saying that's, that's kind of not okay at the same time. It's more that cultural change can be can have to happen sometimes in uncomfortable ways. And I, I think kind of following on from that, because you said originally is productivity doing things to a better quality or doing more of it. Um, and in a way, yes, it's that freedom to do things, but it also comes from an imposed cultural change. We found it through um, things with Athena Swan of, you know, generally men will produce lots of output and women will produce fewer outputs of a higher quality. So we can't discuss productivity as being up to the individual if it's going to have a negative effect on culture change. And maybe we need to think about the culture change first before we think about the definition of productivity. So I guess just while the microphone is moving, I'm just going to add a sort of personal note on this. Um, and that's actually just in terms of the shift towards remote work and remote offices versus physical offices. So Overleaf is a remote first company, so generally everyone is spread out around the world, um, which in and of itself creates some challenges as to how you set that up. Um, but because we do have an office in London and a few of us are based in London, we can meet up and, and we can talk about things. So we actually have to be quite rigorous in making sure that we don't have discussions there that exclude other people, you know, just because we happen to be there and in the in the room together, we have to make sure that we, we kind of do things through Slack or do things through like the, the communication channels that include everyone else. And that actually is something you do have to sort of impose on yourself um, or impose kind of just generally as a, you know, just, yeah, I mean, it's not, I don't know whether it counts as cultural change or just productivity enhancement because they're kind of, they're both quite in, intertwined. But like that's something that we've definitely noticed is that it's very easy to sort of, you know, fall into just having a chat with people in the real world when actually you, you you get a better app if you include other people and have that in the right way with a remote kind of team as well. Oh, right. Um, so the idea around productivity and, and the theming on, on, on CW, I mean, it's always interesting to see how things change, and it does really very much depend on the, the people that were involved. Um, it's quite narrowly, the motivation to increase productivity in CW was quite narrowly kind of motivated last year. It was to do with, uh, we're looking at tooling, providing tooling for people to do more in less time, and to maybe do reproducible research by stealth, to use version control by stealth, uh, all of these great things. So to get people to be able to use this stuff, as it were, and how do you engineer systems to do that? Now we did have a detractor from this, he's not here, <laughs> but, um, and he was like, well, okay, you give all this, all this cool stuff to people to do that, and they are starting to move much more quickly, but they can't debug it. And if they can't debug it, you have to ask yourself, why did you give it to them in the first place? So it was kind of this pressure between allowing people to move quickly, but then do they still have the skills to solve their problems? Let's see if I can get this across here. Yeah, I think uh, the definition of productivity uh, differs from person to person and also on <coughs> depends on the on which level you are in the organization. If you are at a really high level, like a VP or an owner, then productivity 
can be getting the planned work done in the planned budget. But if you are a, a, a manager, then you want to, productivity for you is making sure you get the work that you promised your superiors, that work is done in the right budget with the right resources. And if you're a team member, or if I'm, I'm, if I'm working with my colleagues, for me productivity is ensuring that my work gets done with the least amount of frustration, you know, so that I, uh, so things the infrastructure provided should be such that each category of like individuals in the company can get the productivity that they aspire to achieve. And actually, that's a really interesting thing. So I'm just reminded of something that happened earlier involving yourself um, and a few others in, in productivity and culture change, which is uh, getting access to the Wi-Fi, a piece of infrastructure that makes you more productive, but which you can have slightly differing uh, ways of looking at it, where you don't expect, for instance, there to be international visitors without a UK phone coming along. So uh, riffing on that, here's a question for the panel and for the audience. What should a good organization provide to um, its employees, its visitors, etc., uh, that generally they, most organizations don't provide that would help this? So, you know, we all take for granted now that um, we should have access to a good, high quality um, internet connection. And I know that's not the case in, in many countries, but sort of thinking along those lines. Are there tools, are there pieces of infrastructure, are there things, processes of support that a good organization should be striving to provide that they just aren't just now? So I don't think this is what you're looking for, actually, Neil, but I'm going to try anyway. Right. <laughs> um, so I think that, interpreting that quite broadly, I think that for a lot of institutions, a lot of organizations, um, actually what you want is not necessarily them to provide something specific but to not limit you in terms of what you can do and what you're allowed to use. Do you want yeah. to say something about No, I'm seconding that. Excellent, right, good, <laughs> seconding, so that's good. So, so yeah, so I, I don't have the answer to like the magic software, but I think not imposing limits on people is, is helpful. Can I, can I add yeah, one thing? Yeah. Sorry. I, I completely agree. The way that I was going to phrase it, but it's exactly the same point, is to have a human-centered admin team. So people who work for the organization who consider their jobs to be something about helping the humans who are in the, who are in the team. And I think that is something that people come <coughs> into jobs with and they, I, I feel very confident that they get it trained out of them. And um, just just remembering that there are new people, I'm really, really passionate about onboarding, and so providing known information on the, on the early, just everyone benefits, everything's easier. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid you just uh, beat me to exactly what you, <laughs> I was going to say in the time that the microphone took it. Um, I was going to say something similar, and then from my experience, there's people like me who is a research software engineer who likes getting their hands dirty and trying out new technology and just basically fiddling with things until I'm happy. Um, there are also people who want to concentrate on their research and don't want to have to get their hands dirty playing with new tools all the time. But I think what's most important is that to have somebody on hand who can basically guide them if they want be if they want guiding. I think that's where this is where research software engineers like like me are quite useful because it's having been a researcher and having spoken to researchers, researchers have a certain mindset and that they don't like being told what to do. And I think that's something that makes a good researcher in that you can go and stand up in front of a conference and say, this is my opinion. Um, you can publish research and be confident about it, but also tends to act as a blocker to new ideas. Uh, having someone around who can not lead them by the nose, but have some experience and just show examples is useful. And that's where, as you said, people come in handy. Actually, that's a good thing. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask, I'll go to James, and then I'm going to ask people if they have any examples of really good um, things that they've seen, like good human-centered processes at their own organizations. Because I think it's worthwhile calling out 
what they are um, so that other people can go and knock on the doors of their own organizations and say, why can't we have this? So, James. I, I just want to follow up so quickly on what Sher said about debugging, actually, which is that there's something in there about infrastructures that, that don't foist productivity software on people at the expense of their principles. So I'm struck by the kind of the disconnect between the purpose of productivity software to make you more productive and like the foundational stuff you get from software carpentry, which it of course wants to make you productive, but make you productive based on a series of principles that means that you don't get productive and then fail down the line because you can't solve the problem you need to solve. But you still remember the piece in the middle. And there, there's something there about how infrastructures again are kind of social in a way, where they're they're like not just saying you have to use this set of stuff, otherwise you're not going to get a functional organization, but then you lose the things that make you good at what you do. Thank you. So, do people have examples that they'd like to call out of really good, good kind of practices around this? Or are we all really, like, oh, yeah. So this is a very interesting topic, and it is much deeper than, than uh, one would think. So, so as some of you know, I work for the IDEAS team, right? We work on software productivity, uh, software sustainability uh, in the US for exascale projects. And we were trying to uh, come up with something similar. How do you improve productivity? What can one do to improve productivity? But if you look at organizations throughout the world, productivity, when you talk about improving productivity, it's just not improving infrastructure productivity, software productivity, or hardware productivity. If you want to make an employee more productive, Basically, how can you make his or her life easier? I remember organizations where I worked with used to offer oil change services so that I save time and don't have to take my car for an oil change. My current organization offers physical therapy. So if I have pain, I don't have to run to a physical therapist during lunch hour. Uh, you know, Companies like Facebook, Google, they offer free food, free laundry, yoga rooms, meditation rooms, and so on. So all this essentially boils down to making the employee emotional and physical state good enough to eventually lead, lead to you know, improved productivity. So the question is that ultimately, ultimately where do you draw the line as to you know, spending money and resources on making employees more productive? And what is the culture in your company uh, tuned to? So that this is a fairly interesting topic. I bet you can have like dozens of research papers on this. Thank you. Right. Okay. I just want to, to follow up on that. And when I hear stories of companies offering free food and laundry and, and all these things, that sounds to me like a company that's trying to make me work stupid hours. Um, I, I've done that like, during my PhD, I worked far too long and burnt out, so I think a really important thing for productivity is actually being able to step away from work and do not work for a while, however you want to define that. That's a very good point to make. Um, I don't think you were here when I asked this question last time, like, uh, it's super confusing, but it was one that has come up again and again on these topics, on, for me at least, is really then how much of this, how much of like these questions about productivity, how much of it is a function of the funding environment? How much of it is a function of like the availability of resources? Um, because sometimes these discussions tend towards, well, maybe we should just do away with capitalism. Maybe that's the problem, right? <laughs> which, which is a lot harder to accomplish than what we have time for, right? So, uh, so I, like we talk about getting free stuff, you know, uh, or or you know, uh, stress people are put under. A lot of that really always seems to come back to, well, how are they getting their funding? How are they sustaining that funding? Okay, uh, I want to give come back to a very specific example about this human centric um, at IT administration, because. Um, we had a situation where we wanted to uh, update some tools which we use, which were like Manta, so really old school. And um, the first approach of a, as, as computer scientists was to find the most powerful and best tool that you can find, um, so that we would cover all the needs. But we were forced by our central IT to spend money with a consultant to really figure out what the people we were working for and we want to help with uh, need. 
And this was something new for me because I thought, okay, I'm a computer scientist, I know how to write code, so I, I know which tools I get. Um, but the thing we learned is that everybody said we just want to have like one page where there's everything. So we figured out we have to have a source forge from some kind, so we went with GitLab. But in the end, it was like the most important thing is what we had in our chart where we asked people whether they said it has to be one website where I can find everything the source code, the issues, the wiki, like everything should be there. It shouldn't be, and it wouldn't be one click to get this new infrastructure. I don't want to apply somewhere, talk to somebody. It has to be one click and I have to have it immediately. And this was much more, more important than the functionality of the issue track and all the stuff we focus on in the beginning. It went all back to usability and especially to be productive, to have one click and have something. They would find a way to work with it somehow. They just didn't care about the features as much as that it's just there. And this was uh, something I learned and where I figured this was the first time we made the right choice, a human-based choice and not uh, a topic or a based choice. Uh, I, this is slightly off on a tangent, sorry everyone. Um, and it's not entirely about uh, the, the, the good practice, but just the thought that, that, that suddenly occurred to me based on some of the things that have been said. I think sometimes uh, there's a, there are issues in institutions around people having time to be productive, and that sounds like a, uh, quite a, 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 an, an odd thing to say. But I think learning these kind of tools or learning methodologies or learning things to do to be productive takes some time. I think sometimes we don't have. Uh, my my experience is that there is uh, there is a resistance to learning tools, even if the training is available, because there is no time. I don't have time to learn to use Git or version control or blah 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 because I need to publish my paper. You know, so I just wanted to sort of throw that in at this point. I'll just throw in a quick example whilst the mic is travelling. Um, this is a really simple one, which fix on the human interaction. Um, as we grew the remote team, like you have a lot of meetings and a lot of catch up with people, and we found they were increasingly just operational, just talking through lists of things that um, people were having problems with and needed needed fixing. And actually, it was really it was a, it was a waste of that actual time that we were talking together. So we switched to the person, you know, or the, or the two people sort of having a sort of email list of things they were working on, and then the call was just maybe talking through the top three that were maybe frustrating, and the rest of it was just a chat. So actually, each week you were just chatting with like the, the people that you were reporting to or that you were working with, rather than it spending that whole time going bullet by bullet down a list of items. And I realized that you never actually talked about some of the frustrations or the wider, the wider issues. So that was just the thing that really helped us as a, as a growing team. Um, I just wanted to share one thing about the um, ni nice human factors. So that's um, one thought is to hire based on personality. I mean, you don't say, I want to get the very best coders or the very best scientists. Say, like, I want the very friendliest coders and the very friendliest scientists. Because at the end of the day, you're going to have to work with them every day, and spending days worrying about egos is far, far less productive than spending time discussing it and working out the bad things. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, OK, I'm going to take Alice, and then I'm going to ask uh, something of the whole panel. Hi, so I just had a quick follow up going back to that tools discussion and um, please get out of my way and you know don't impose and this kind of thing. So what do we think of, in my experience, sort of working in a central IT department with an RSE team, I find that some people really want the freedom to choose and some people really don't want to think about it and would like you to choose for them. So how do we balance those things? And also the situation where some tools only really work if it is a shared choice. You know, you only get those productivity benefits if everybody does pick the same one. I just wondered if there were any thoughts on that, but perhaps there's not. Yeah, go for it. Any? So, I take your point and I do recognise it, and I think that the thing that people often want help with, which they don't get enough of, is you, you have something imposed on you, or you have <coughs> um, a choice, and what you want is guidance. And so I think having a default and having guidance, but allowing choice is the way to go. I I'm sorry, give it. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, it is, I, I think, a default and then deviations from the, the, the norm kind of works. But uh, reaching agreement on what the default should be is in itself problematic. And um, so, for example, I, I grew up in, in a generation where people could phone you without making an appointment to phone you. And um, they could just, and then you would answer your phone call, hello. 
anyway, and, and, and now there are people that I work with or, or, or do business with, and you phone them and they say, what, what, what are you, why did my phone ring? What's it? You know, this is not what this does. Um, <laughs> um, I, and it's difficult because I, I find it a lot more productive to have a, a five, ten minute conversation than to exchange a hundred emails. I hate email. I would happily, you know, um, strike, strike it from the, the history books. Um, but I have colleagues that, that have got a great fear of talking to people. Um, and and uh, and how we we, we we balance that? We just don't. <laughs> it doesn't happen. So. Oh. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, well. yeah. 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 So for a starting PhD student, uh, software carpentry works wonders. And we're even talking about us, how we're going to make, between us, how we're going to make all of new UCL students do software carpentry, you know, right? In a stadium, one lay with huge loudspeaker. Uh, but that's a valid argument. Have a curriculum for the starting ones and then providing support appropriate to the level of, uh, of the researchers. So for example, we have a, drop-in sessions that have grown up very, very popular, that people come in with specific questions, and you sit down with them and, and work through to whatever issues in person. And for some people, this would not be enough. There's mailing lists, there's, uh, and then you go on and on, but kind of a tiered approach of the level of support that some would need. Uh, yeah, just to add to that and related to the lack of time that we all suffer, I think it's really important so to provide training but also provide guidance on at different levels in an organization of what training would be needed for you from people with more experience in, in why it will, be, it will make you more productive. Because sometimes we don't have the time and we don't know how to judge uh, what training would be suitable to, to make our work more productive. So I think in that case, the organization could help uh, in providing this guidance, maybe through mentorships or things like that. Okay, so I'm going to ask something to the panel now. Um, we've heard all of these ideas, we've heard kind of like different um, ways in which we can be better, basically. Um, so who are the people we need to persuade? Um, what, who, who's the more important groups, uh, and how do we do that? So, um, Kirsi? So, I think it's the funders. It's the world's most sort of obvious statement. But basically, in a capitalist society, money is what controls, ultimately. And one of the things that I, I got an email recently from a clinical school in Cambridge, saying that all grants now in their costing, so when you put in an application, you have to include a, a couple of thousand pounds per year for training for any postdoctoral researcher. So if you're going to hire in a postdoc, you have to budget that amount of time that is allocated probably for them to go on co to conferences and present, right? So it's not actually the most sort of radical statement that's ever been made. But it's a really, really nice nudge in the direction of um, actually investing in the early career researchers. And I think it relates to this question of sort of, you can provide all of the trainings you want, but if the person who's going to write the um, recommendation letter that's gonna get you the next job, if they don't think you need those trainings, people will not turn up. And so I think finding ways to sort of coerce the senior researchers who don't have a personal investment in changing the way in which they work, finding ways of sort of basically forcing them to use your money. Whilst the microphone passes, I've yeah. got a response from Dan. So yeah, so I was just gonna say quickly that um, as a former funding person, um, I. I like what you're saying to some extent, and then maybe disagree a little bit as well. And the model that I've always seen is that um, culture change is kind of like a wave, and there's a leading edge of the wave, which I think you were actually describing in your talk, which I appreciate. Um, and the funding agency is a little bit behind that, and they're basically trying to 
pull the rest of the community along with the leading edge where they think it makes sense. And so I, I don't feel like the funding agency actually can get very far ahead of the leading part of the community or else it collapses. But we don't, we don't need to be far ahead. Like everyone in this room knows what we would, we would like to see. There's lots and lots of changes that we would like to see. But it's actually a very small number of people who are here. So yes, I agree with you. And that's why the first half of my talk was all about sort of grassroots movements. But I've heard this, I've heard it from journals and I've heard it from funders that they, we just respond, well, you know, I really push back on that because the proportion of researchers who are in that grassroots movement in 2018 is still too small. And it has to, it has to scale, it has to become bigger, and it's the funders that can force it. When you pre-surveyed these kind of questions, I wrote down funders at some point, but I, so I'm not going to add much more, apart from that. Gomez as I said earlier, I don't think that funders writing lots of mandates is going to be helpful either. What I think is helpful with funders is that, of course, you know, the work that comes through funders is, is judged by the peer community, but there are guidelines within which they expect their peer community to operate. And I think it's funders ensuring that they make sure they do what they say they're going to do in the guidance that people who are looking at stuff. So for example, not saying you know you have to have three thousand pounds a year for postdoc training, but making it clear in the in the you know, application documentation that it's thoroughly welcome that that kind of thing might happen and reinforcing that among the people who end up making decisions about whether stuff gets funded or not funded, that that is actually a priority that we have right now. So it's not stick, it's more I think it's it's, it's the funders have a way into the senior communities, right? I think certainly my experience of working with funders is that actually a lot of funders want to see this happen because they know that this is good for the research community. And the challenge is, I mean, the reason why this is good in that top-down way is both because uh, it, it is the way into the senior people because if there's one thing that really motivates people at the professorial level and above, it's getting money into a university and funders are the way to get money into a university. But also it's good for us as a community because it gives us something to go, no, look, here, here there is this thing. People do want this thing and we can kind of say, it's been asked for, now give it to us. Uh, so it works both ways. Um, I think the challenge for us is giving clear messages on what it is we want to see the funders put into those mandates. And that's where the things like, uh, in your talk, Kirsty, about the idea of onboarding scaling up maybe applies to this community as well. You know, how do we, how do we all go out of this room confident we know who to talk to to get our messages straight? So, Carolyn. Um, so in terms of how we do it, I think that's quite an interesting question. So if I look at something quite specific, which is the status of software within research. So I love coming to Collaborations Workshop because it's like this glorious echo chamber of everybody who <laughs> um, you know, understands the importance of this and that's fantastic and it's, so it's a safe space for us, it's good. Um, but obviously out there, you know, there are lots of people who need convincing and it's, it's funders, it's senior managers at university, it's PhD students, it's our colleagues, you know. So, so there are lots of people who maybe don't understand this. And, and one of the tactics I've been trying recently, and I don't know whether it's working, but is to sort of start using analogy. So, if you talk to people about software and there's a role of software in society, you can see that it's, you know, it's quite straightforward to see that the people now who have all of the power and all of the influence and who run the world are really the software engineers, right? It's the geeks who've taken over. And that is what's gonna happen in science as well. And it's starting to happen now. And in the future, if you're not able to code, if you can't do reproducible research, I don't know how long it's gonna take. I know it's hard for us to do so. <laughs> um, then you are not going to have, you know, that, that's going to kind of bypass you. And so I think ultimately tech is going to take over in research and in science as it has done everywhere else. But I hasten to add, I mean take over like in a good way rather than undermining the democracy kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is a bad time to pick up the microphone. Well, <laughs> go ahead anyway. I was actually just going to, I think funders can make a big difference. And I think some of the statements that they made around open access or open data have actually helped move that on a lot and certainly helped push it forward with the publishers and with others that um, you know, maybe it hadn't before they got involved. And the other one for me is just um, like the going earlier than PhD students, and actually undergraduate students and even, and even kids and, and you know, school students. Because I think you learn a lot of this stuff early on. Um, 
you know, you learn about collaboration, you, you know, it's a lot easier, like, you know, schoolwork, it's a lot easier to make it collaborative. And we have examples of, um, like, out of school robotics classes who then write up their, you know, engineering notebook on Overleaf and publish it. And they've effectively published, there was this great, these seventh and eighth graders in the US called the Nano Ninjas. And um, they built a robot and wrote up this 200 page engineering notebook and published it online. And that's out there now for everyone. And they made it available as a template so others can use it. Um, and they've basically written their thesis at like seventh and eighth grade, I feel like, looking at it. Um, so I feel like it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of this stuff is going to be driven by the work that's being done by the communities and the coding and, and just the general things within schools and within, you know, universities at the undergraduate level to help just encourage these practices early on and then hopefully they'll naturally take them into. That, that is amazing and I think a good segue into like the last thing I'm going to ask you as panelists just before we run out of time, um, which is briefly, you have 20 seconds each um, and there's a clock running there as well. Um, so yes, um, what, what one piece of advice would you give to someone at the end of their high school then? Um, for who is interested in going into into research, um, or into the academic, or into the software develop, you know, research software engineering community, and we'll just go from John onwards. <laughs> Sorry, oh, I, mean, I knew this was going to happen. Like, <laughs> Twenty seconds is not long, but I so I feel like there's a couple of things that I've um, I've taken, and I guess I use those as advice. So I think the naive optimism. Is a good thing. I think looking at things in a positive mindset and um, just assuming that, that things are the way they are not because of malice but because of incompetence or because of it's always the way things have been done. I think seeing things in that mindset definitely helps. And the other thing I would just take is is, is be nice to people. Um, it comes along about comments earlier on about hiring people you want to get on with. Like actually, that's that's a big part of how we hire people. Um, is we try and hire nice people, and there's no easy way to quantify that but actually it goes a long way to, to fostering good relationships. And I think all of the people I still keep in touch with, I would like to think are people that I think of as nice and kind. And so I would just encourage people to be nice and kind. And it's a bit of a woolly message, but there we are. <laughs> Caroline. Um, so I think this is something that, that Kirsty touched on really when she talks about cramming science. I would say um, strive for objectivity, trust in the method, don't find yourself pursuing stuff that right, sort of is pointless or external to science. Trust the scientific method um, and really make sure you're just looking for new knowledge, new discoveries, and not just for information. Um, so if I was advising myself on how to be more productive um, in my career, I would say uh, from, from the very beginning, uh, take time, make time uh, to think about things and, and resist the, the pressure to be doing all the time. Uh, there, there are two things that I look at every day and spend more than an hour every day looking at, and that's my to-do list and my calendar, and try and make the two things uh, <laughs> add, add up. And if you, uh, you'll find a way, if you stare at that to-do list long enough and that calendar long enough, you can do it. Okay. Yeah. So um, mine was a combination of be kind, and don't let the bastards get you down. Don't um, <laughs> make, believe in yourself and believe in the good in others around you. Cheers. Okay, so in relation to software development, the programming, the data stuff, so the first is that if you fail spectacularly and fail again, that helps you be more productive later. And the second is it's perfectly fine occasion just to slog through a bunch of manual stuff. Don't put so much pressure <laughs> on yourself to learn some kind of semi-automated way of doing something that takes you longer to figure out. You're never going to do it again. Um, and that's hard to learn, but slog occasionally. Manual slogging is good. <laughs> it's good for the brain and everything. Uh, I, thank you very much. I, mine was, uh, because I shared it with the panel as well, was, is basically uh, get feedback, but don't let it define you. So, you know, like, I think I would have been a, a much better person if I'd learned not to judge myself by how other people see me. Um, but Thank you very much. I'm glad you did not judge me as a chair. <laughs> um, but I am judging all of you, and I think you're all wonderful. Um, thank you so much for contributing to this big self-help session. 
uh, and um, let's continue this conversation into the break. If there was something that you that came up that you thought, actually, this is the spark of something that we could do together, put it into a discussion session. Um, suggest it's a hack idea. Uh, because now the workshop is going to move into the mode of getting together into small groups to find out what it is uh, we have in common that we would like to make the world better. So, thank you very much, and thank you to all the panelists.